Welcome to The Economy Magazine. I'm Benjamin Chong Alfares with the news from the global economy on today's show. Terror in Tunisia spells trouble for tourism. And the Petrobras scandal claims more victims following massive layoffs. First, the headlines. Asian stocks rallied to new highs on Monday, fueled by the prospect of additional stimulus from Beijing and easing worries of an upcoming rate hike in the U.S. Chinese stocks extended their longest winning streak in nearly eight years, while in Japan, the Nikkei stock average rose to a fresh 15-year high. The Shanghai Composite Index rose 2 percent, marking its ninth straight day of wins. Chinese shares took heart from official comments, indicating that senior leadership is not worried about the market rising any further. China at a development forum on Sunday promoted the concept of a new regional bank. China's finance minister Lo Jiwei said China is looking into establishing a new regional lender to cooperate with the Asian Development Bank. The China-backed Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank would stimulate growth in emerging Asia and help boost the lingering global recovery. International Monetary Fund Managing Director Christine Lagarde praised the idea, saying there is massive room for cooperation on infrastructure financing. I wish the IMF could be in the business of financing uh, infrastructure projects. This is not at all our business. Uh, so there cannot be any competition between the AIIB and us, but there will certainly be cooperation and we would be delighted uh, to cooperate uh, with the institution. We stay in China as the China National Chemical is leading a bid for Italian tire manufacturer Pirelli for around $7.7 billion. The deal would give China, the largest auto market in the world, control of one of the world's top tire brands. If the tender is completed, it would be one of the largest overseas acquisitions by a Chinese state firm in recent years. The partnership would strengthen Pirelli's presence in China, doubling its volume of industrial tires sold to about 12 million pieces a year. Shell Oil Company, one of the largest oil firms in the world, could soon be allowed to drill for crude in the American Arctic. U.S. Department of Interior Secretary Sally Jewell is expected to announce the decision on Wednesday. The drilling would occur in the Chukchi and Beaufort seas of the Arctic near Alaska. But environmentalists are concerned with the issue since technology has not been prepared to deal with an oil spill in that region. Environmental impact statement claims there is a 75 percent chance of a large spill occurring. Results of regional elections in Spain show the anti-austerity sentiment that brought Syriza to power in Greece may be taking root in Spain. The PP and the socialists who have dominated power nationally for decades came first and second in the vote, but lost support since the 2012 elections. Though Spanish Socialist Party PSOE won the regional election in Andalusia with 47 seats, anti-austerity party Podemos won 15 out of 109 in the regional parliament. The socialists now have the tricky task of establishing a coalition to govern in Andalusia as rivals worry how deals reached there could damage them in elections later this year. The two traditional big forces have fallen by 17 seats. That means 20 points, and Podemos have won 15. We have gone from zero to 15. We are the protagonists of the change, of the creation of new alternatives, new down-to-earth alternatives that will meet the urgent needs of the majority of Andalusians. Russian police detained dozens of demonstrators in Moscow's Red Square on Sunday, protesting the plight of Russians trapped in dollar-dominated mortgages. The ruble's dramatic plunge since 2014, following the decline in oil prices and economic sanctions, nearly doubled mortgage debts. The Russian central bank last week said 405 billion rubles, about 67 million dollars would be provided to those who have to pay off mortgages in foreign currency. But only around 2,000 people would be eligible for government help. We're ready to continue paying properly as we did, but we want to pay by a fair rate, because in this situation, we will not be physically able to pay this kind of money. And I don't know who will benefit, maybe the banks, if my children end up living on the street.
Last Wednesday's brutal assault on tourists in Tunis has cast a terrible shadow over the birthplace of the Arab Spring. Tourism plays a major role in the Tunisian economy, and the large-scale attack could have a lasting impact on the fragile industry. Aytafranur's journalist Daniel Roth reports. The attack on the Bardo Museum in Tunis plunged Tunisia and onlookers into panic. Fourteen passengers of Costa Cruises and MSC Cruises were murdered. 6,000 tourists were then docked in the port of Tunis. The two companies decided to lift anchor that evening, leave port, and suspend stops in Tunisia. As we said, about three minutes before it happened, we had left the square. And once inside the bus, we began to see many ambulances, soldiers with machine guns everywhere. Shipping companies and travel agencies have decided to suspend their visits to the capital. These kinds of cancellations could be disastrous for the economy. The tourism sector represents 7 percent of the country's GDP and impacts close to 400,000 people directly and indirectly. That's one-tenth of the population. We're really very fearful now. It'll pass by word to mouth in France, in Europe, everywhere else in the world. For the first bookings in April, I think people probably won't cancel. But over the tourist season, we're going to feel the drop in tourists, and that's really not good. It's another blow for Tunisia as it builds back to its pre-revolution, pre-democracy peak. In 2011, the transition to democracy hit tourism by 30 percent, but an increase had been taking place with millions arriving in 2013 and 2014. Many are showing solidarity in the face of this uphill battle from Tunisia and elsewhere. Not only did we stay, but we've come to protest. And we will show our support for the Tunisian people who are right to react forcefully and come together against terrorism. We come from France, and France has been affected too. In the face of terror, Tunisians are worried again for their young democracy and economy. Four years after the revolution, the youth unemployment rate is at 38 percent, and one in three has been in that state for more than one year. But it's not all doom and gloom for Tunisia, as the country has several economic plans lined up for the near future. I24 News reporter Ayman Siksek joins us now for more on the Tunisian economy and financial bazaar. Ayman, thanks for joining us. Big happy to be here, Binyamin. Yeah, so. What are you, what's going on with uh, Tunisia in terms of the economic situation? Well, they have a few plans to get over this uh, potential disaster in terms of tourism following the terror attack. Yeah. The government of Tunisia actually announced the plan of several really, really deep-rooted economic reforms. Their aim is to reach GDP growth of 7 percent by 2020. Now, it looks like this is possible. They grew by almost 3 percent last year, and they want to grow another 3.7 percent in 2015. So a 7 percent growth by 2020 seems like um, a really attainable goal at this point. Right. And this includes several reforms on uh, several platforms. They want to introduce transparency to their mm -hmm. banks. They want to mm -hmm. stop corruption, uh, introducing new laws for banks. Uh, and there has been a lot of corruption in banks in Tunisia. And this is a soft spot for Tunisia because it has been a symbol for democracy or the possibility of democracy yeah. after um, uh, a dictator is ousted in the Arab world. The only example Clearly. so far. So this obviously, I mean, is kind of a setback I mean, in terms of the tourism industry, not just in terms of I mean, potentially less tourists going to Tunisia and less money coming in to Tunisia through tourism, but also because it might add a, a, an additional challenge to the government, right? Absolutely. And I think the United States is sensing that too. Of course, the United States wants to encourage uh, stable economic growth in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. And for that uh, purpose, President Obama just announced that they will be um, making a uh, almost $1 billion available to uh, Tunisia to encourage investment within Tunisia, not foreign investment, but to encourage entrepreneurs within Tunisia in several uh, genres and several right. areas of uh, finance, including banking. But the United States is worried about bankruptcy laws and uh, especially corruption within the banking industry in Tunisia. So they were very, very clear that before Tunisia can receive this money, they will have to introduce new laws to how their banking industries run. 
Right, and clearly also, I mean, um, uh, this will encourage other investors also to put in money. Of course, Tunisia is very closely involved with France, with other countries in the European Union as well. And there's more money coming in besides um, from America as well, isn't there? There's also uh, something else in terms of investment. That's right. The Local? Overseas uh, Private Investment Corporation pledged almost $50 million to Tunisian banks. Again, the banks are a heavy, heavy emphasis with what we do with Tunisia now. So it looks like... Uh, the future is bright. Wonderful. I'm in zigzag. Thanks for joining us and giving us more of an understanding of what to expect in Tunisia. Thank you, Vinyan. Thank you. The corruption scandal at Brazilian state-controlled oil giant Petrobras has so far claimed several victims among the country's higher echelons. But many of the workers who flocked to the oil industry during its boom years have fallen victim to mass layoffs. Black flags fly over a city in mourning. In Taburai, just east of Rio, is one of the latest victims of the Petrobras corruption scandal, which has caused mass layoffs here. Like many other local businesses, this guest house is about to shut down. My main client is under investigation. I've been working with them for six years, but now, because of this investigation, all their payments have been frozen. They owe me over 500,000 reais. So I'm about to close the doors of this home forever. Back in 2008, during the oil industry's boom, thousands of residents flocked to the city to build a new refinery owned by state-controlled Petrobras. But the corruption probe has forced the oil giant to slow down investments and freeze payments to contractors under investigation. Jesse recently found out his employer alumni is accused of paying massive bribes to secure contracts with Petrobras. He hasn't been paid since December and no longer has access to food stamps or health care. We've been abandoned, and up until this point, nobody has come to the home to check up on us, not even one of our bosses. Nobody comes. We've really been abandoned. In just two years, the workforce in Itaborai has shrunk from 35,000 to less than 10,000. Left with nothing, many of those laid off have no other choice than to eat at soup kitchens and sleep on the streets. With all this corruption stuff at Petrobras, things are really hard. Before it was all good, there was work. But since the scandal burst, it's all a mess. But I keep going. I'm looking for work. I do small jobs here and there, and I eat for one real. That helps. What used to be Brazil's El Dorado for black gold is now a ghost town, engulfed in Brazil's worst graft scandal. And Daniel Rod guides us now off the beaten track for a look at some other stories from the news in Media Watch. Daniel, thanks How's for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, other stories, but important stories. Yes, uh, the New York Times ran a piece. When you look at actual nepotism in American society, they were looking at and you wonder, well, is it just kind of a feeling I have? Of course, the Clintons uh, seem to be having a little bit of influence on presidencies in the Being last few Hillary decades. Clinton is coming back. Uh, of course, uh, the Bushes also have their fair share right. of presidential stories. Right. Uh, so the question was, there are these cases you can point to, uh, but what about the big data? What does the big data say about whether nepotism does favor uh, a fortune in the United States? And the answer is yes, nepotism exists, and it's real and it's harsh. Uh, if you are the child of a billionaire, you have a one in nine chance of becoming a billionaire, of, uh, of, be of uh, becoming a billionaire, whereas if you are not, you have a one in 258,000 chance. But isn't it like, it does, doesn't it make sense, isn't it logical that if you are a child of a billionaire, you will presumably inherit all that money and become a billionaire? In many cases, yes. In many cases, no. There are, we're also in the first generation of billionaires, so mm -hmm. some of those numbers are still rolling in. In Major League Baseball, you have a 1 in 73 chance of becoming a ball player right. if your uh, father was a ball player, if not 1 in 15,000. Now, um, I'm going to try to play devil's advocate here because I also read the story, and the story essentially was looking at the fact that Jeb Bush might be going against Hillary Clinton. You know, again, right. Bush against Clinton. But Hillary Clinton was next to Bill Clinton for so many years. She's an extremely intelligent woman. And, you know, Jeb Bush 
you know, whatever. I mean, he's part of the Bush family, you know. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously, these people have been in the circuit, have been around politics for so long. I mean, they've been honed, mm -hmm. so to speak, to take on this seat. Is that really nepotism, or is it just that they've been, you know, honed to sort of uh, rule? It's, I think, a key component of nepotism is that, is that you're around money, or you're around ball playing, or you're around politics. And, and in so Israel, it's the same thing also, isn't in, it? In Israel, of course, uh, you know, right now there's all these stories flowing around that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is uh, grooming his son Yair to take his place. Bougie, of course, is the son of a former president. Yeah, it exists. Lapid also. Yeah, you're Lapid, Tommy Lapid. It exists across the board, and uh, and when you're talking about meritocracies, that's the question. That's Are the we question. a meritocracy right. or well, Daniel not? Roth, we'll try to figure that out next time. Thanks for joining yeah. us. I'm Benjamin Mitchell Faris. That is the end of our Economy Magazine for today. Join us again tomorrow for more on the economy.